freedom of speech. It's a phrase that gets a lot of attention these days. Invocations of liberal philosophers come up to defend that conservative speaker or defend that radical right-wing speaker or... Wait, I'm noticing a pattern here. There are a lot of claims of censorship wafting around the public discourse and article after article of think pieces claiming that the right to speak your mind has become embattled. To give this context, let's talk about a different case of free speech and censorship. A situation where someone faced criminal charges for being offensive in America. This is the story of Lenny Bruce, the stand-up comic that went to bat to fight censorship. Maybe through his story, we can see how to save freedom of speech. Hi, I'm Tristan. This is Step Back. Subscribe and hit the bell notification to get history every week. Lenny Bruce, the famous comedian, was born in a Jewish family in Manola, New York. At five, his parents divorced, and throughout his childhood, he lived with various relatives. Most famously, his mother was Sally Marr, who was a stage performer, and during his comedy career would be a regular part of his life, often giving him opportunities and helping him get his foot in the door, so to speak. At the age of 16 in 1942, he joined the U.S. Navy and saw active duty fighting for the Allies in North Africa and Italy. His time was cut short, however, when in 1945 he performed dressed in drag for a bunch of shipmates, and that got the commanding officers very upset. The ship's medical officer was convinced that Lenny Bruce was a homosexual and discharged him, although they didn't have enough evidence to give him a dishonorable discharge in 1945. And afterwards, that is when he decided to get his career started. He settled down in New York City with the dream of wanting to become a comedian. However, he found differentiating himself in the very crowded realm of New York comedy a little difficult, until he met a mentor named Joe Ansis, who helped him develop his stream-of-consciousness style and riding that line of vulgarity. And just two years later, he had his first stand-up gig. But it was a very millennial stand-up gig in which he was basically performing for $12 and a plate of spaghetti. And also during his life, he got in trouble for a whole bunch of things. One case was where he worked at a laundry in which he managed to nick a few priest collars and use those collars to run a scam for raising money for a leper colony. He gave out $2,000 of what he raised to a leper colony, which apparently saved him from prosecution, but still, eh. Lenny Bruce also had a lot of trouble with drugs. In 1961, he was arrested for drug possession, but that wouldn't be the only time that drugs would play an important part in his life. But I think that the most famous thing that Lenny Bruce is known for is obscenity. He had a very open, freestyle, critical form of comedy that integrated satire, politics, religion, sex, and vulgarity. And this is the time when people were doing simple jokes about their cars or their wives or whatnot. He would go on these long rants, he would do comic routines or do satirical interviews on themes that other comedians weren't touching. He talked about jazz and then would move to moral philosophy, which would then move to politics, which then moved to patriotism, religion, law, race, abortion, drugs, and sometimes even talked about the Ku Klux Klan. In 1957, he got a job for a nightclub and was fired on his first day because of his material. Often reviewers of Lenny Bruce called him a quote-unquote sick comedian. And not, it's not in like the modern day, like, oh man, that guy's sick. It's like he's sick and perverted. Lenny Bruce responded, of course, by saying that it was the society that was sick, not him. He was blacklisted often from TV with only a few exceptions in which some of his Famous friends would call in huge favors to let him go on TV, but they would be with big concessions to broadcast standards. He was also banned from several towns and even barred entry to the United Kingdom. Things really started to turn bad for Lenny Bruce, though, when he was arrested in 1961 on obscenity charges. It was in San Francisco and he was acquitted, but afterwards, never since then, the FBI and Various undercover cops would be watching his shows and waiting for him to step out of line. And this happened for several years until in 1964, Lenny Bruce was arrested, charged, and convicted in an obscenity trial based on a show he did in Greenwich Village that was heard by undercover cops who went to his show. Which, if you're like an undercover cop, I imagine is one of the better assignments you can get. Like, go to a comedy show and then arrest the guy afterwards. I mean, 
don't arrest people, but the other part sounds fun. When his trial came up, it was a test of the limits of these obscenity laws and people challenging their constitutionality. So many people came out to support Lenny Bruce, even lots of famous entertainers, artists, writers, and educators, even a high profile sociologist named Herbert Gans. It was a big trial. If he had been found guilty, Lenny Bruce would have lost everything. And everybody knew that. The New York City intellectual community rallied behind his cause, founding something called the Emergency Committee Against the Harassment of Lenny Bruce. Over 80 celebrities signed this with the statement, whether we regard Bruce as a moral spokesman or simply as an entertainer, we believe he should be allowed to perform free from censorship or harassment. Some of the famous people who signed it included celebrities like Bob Dylan and Elizabeth Taylor and Norman Mailer and Susan Sontag, even Gore Vidal and Woody Allen. Except there is a bit of a sad ending to all this, which is during the trial on August 3rd of 1966, Lenny Bruce was found dead in his hotel room. He had apparently died of a morphine overdose. And even today, there is debate over whether this was an accidental overdose or suicide. Apparently, the trial itself had done quite a number on Lenny Bruce's psychological health and he had been suffering in the months before. After he died, the funeral held for him was massive. There was over 500 people who came out to pay respects. Maybe because somebody with a sense of humor actually put out ads that encourage people to bring noisemakers and a packed lunch in order to turn the funeral into a jovial experience. One of his friends, Dick Shop, who wrote for Playboy, eulogized Bruce with a memorable last line. One last four letter word for Lenny, dead at 40. That's obscene. And people have been thinking a lot about it ever since to the point where in 2003, this being a first in New York's history, George Pataki actually gave him a posthumous pardon for the obscenity crime. And so Lenny Bruce has had quite a legacy. He's considered the inspiration for many of the counterculture comedians that started to pop up after this period. People like George Carlin, people like his contemporary Richard Pryor, even Robin Williams and Chris Rock. He became a label of the counterculture and a symbol of the 1960s, a time of social and political upheaval. Because of his trial, the obscenity laws that he fought against were quickly seen as a contradiction with the First Amendment of the Constitution, and comedy was never the same. His story has been immortalized time after time in film, on stage, and in print. Rolling Stone in 2017 declared him the third best comedian of all time. The effects of Lenny Bruce's obscenity trial was much more significant than just the realm of comedy. It was part of a shifting consciousness in the 60s towards the First Amendment of the US Constitution itself. A thing that has always been, and still is, evolving. To talk about that, I'm going to introduce Danielle from the channel The Origin of Everything to talk about it. Thanks, Tristan. So the meaning and interpretation of freedom of speech outlined in the First Amendment, just like the rest of the US Constitution, has had varying meanings over time. But at its heart, the portion of the First Amendment that relates to free speech clearly says that Congress cannot pass laws abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Although the law reads as extremely broad, there have been notable exceptions to this rule over time, like children in school, perjury or lying under oath, and you guessed it, obscenity. But Bruce's struggles with the restrictive obscenity laws of the 1960s also parallel a time of increased interest and activism regarding free speech in the US. For example, in 1964, students at the University of California, Berkeley were active in the free speech movement on their campus that was largely centered on the freedom to promote, share, and spread ideas about the civil rights movement happening across the country. But the current standing rule for obscenity laws and obscenity decisions in the US regarding free speech is determined today by the US Supreme Court's ruling in 1973's Miller versus United States, which established a three-pronged test to determine if material was considered obscene. First, whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that work taken as a whole appeals to the period interest. Second, whether the work depicts or describes in patently offensive ways sexual conduct specifically defined by the applicable state law. And third, whether the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. Well, that's it for now, and I'll turn it back over to you, Tristan. Thanks, Danielle. After you watch, like, share, and subscribe to this channel, be sure to go over and go check out a few episodes of The Origin of Everything. If you like Step Back, it will be right up your alley.
Now, Lenny Bruce has become an icon in modern day discussions about freedom of speech that we really need to discuss if we're going to do the whole conversation justice. If you've spent any time on the internet in the last few years, you might be under the impression that freedom of speech and comedy itself is under threat because people are censoring them. This suppression comes in the form of criticizing them on Twitter or not asking them to come speak at their venue or by protesting when their money pays for you to come and talk anyway despite their objections. However, this isn't a fair comparison. Lenny Bruce's obscenity charges weren't just because he was a high profile comedian who used foul language. It was also because he spoke frankly about his experiences enduring anti-Semitism. He spoke in his acts in support of the civil rights movement. He even brought low and critiqued religious authorities. Lenny Bruce talked about how people didn't see the oppressed and lacked empathy for their position. You know what was not considered obscene in this period? Racist caricatures for one, or overtly sexist tropes and stereotypes. Those were completely family-friendly content. The 60s, like now, were a time when language and cultural norms were experiencing a major overhaul. Today, marginalized people are increasingly getting a voice, and they seem pretty sick of a society that punches down on the most vulnerable. They want a comedy that makes the comfortable uncomfortable, and not one that mocks the already nervous. And freedom of speech has done a lot of good even in these times. It protected Stephen Colbert as he mocked the president to his face on live television in 2006. It saved the Dixie Chicks when they criticized a war. It even kept Kathy Griffin out of prison for what I would think is a tasteless joke. Government censorship is real. It exists. And it is terrifying. But putting a gag rule on climate change in a state that is less than 100 years from being underwater and getting called out for oppressive language on Twitter are very different things. And these callouts are leading to productive public conversations anyway. Speech is a powerful thing. It's why we need to protect it from government censorship and also use it responsibly. I'll put a link to a ContraPoints video series on free speech I think you will really like if you are interested in this discussion. However, I will give the last words on this to a quote from GQ magazine from Patton Oswalt. A lot of the arguments and tantrums that I'm hearing from the so-called un-PC crowd are no different than the arguments from baggy pants seltzer bottle comedians when people like Lenny Bruce and Richard Pryor came along. Why do we got to talk about the president and stuff like that? Why can't you just talk about my mother-in-law, my new car that doesn't work? Basically someone going, I don't want to be reminded of where my talent and creativity has plateaued. So now I'm going to fight to stop time so that I can still be relevant. And that exact same shit is happening now with the unpc people. My comedy career got ruined because of political correctness. No, it didn't. You just weren't funny. And now you're trying to find an excuse as to why it got shut down. Just a reminder, if you haven't yet, you should check out the origin of everything. Over there, they unpack things taken for granted in modern society and unwrap its historical roots. It's one of my favorite channels on YouTube, and I really think that if you like Step Back, you will love the origin of everything. I want to thank 12 Tone for the theme song, Thought Slime for the voice of Patton Oswalt, and patrons Don and Carrie Johnson, Colbyn Money, Garrett Kwan, Michael Kirshner, Scott Smith, and James McNeese. Come back next time for more Step Back. If I could get the audio by about Monday, that'd rule. Oh, sorry, Tristan, I probably wasn't supposed to read that part.